Hey everybody, it's Allie, the canine nutritionist from Pad Foot Palms. So I am making this video today to talk to you guys about DCM. <clears throat> and for those of you who don't know, DCM is a veterinary term. Um, it's an abbreviation for dilated cardiomyopathy. It's a heart condition. Um, it is thought to be hereditary, and it is also something that can be diet related. So as many of you know, who are a part of our Padfoot Palms Facebook group, um, thank you, by the way, you know that I have a list of recommended foods and a list of problematic ingredients, and that I follow things like this DCM scare very closely. Um, as a canine nutritionist, it is both interesting to me and also concerning because any time there is something in commercial diets that has become problematic, right, we, we see this trickle effect where more and more and more dogs start to have problems. So what I'd like to do in this video is talk about some of the latest um, in research and talk about why I make the recommendations that I do. So let's get right into it. First up, we've got the initial DCM scare, which, you know, there was some uh, very limited information that was released by the FDA. Um, there was very little statistical information, um, you know, and par for the course for anything relating to pet health, um, the information started to trickle out over time. So in the beginning, there was um, very minimal information that was released by the FDA, by various veterinary associations, right? Um, there was a lot of verbiage that sounded very much like they were trying to put specific kinds of dog food, um, pet food, um, you know, out of business, basically. So there was this huge push for, you know, oh, these exotic foods, you need to stay clear of them because they're the problem, but there wasn't any proof to back that up. And then the secondary problem that came from this is that there was this huge push from vets to recommend foods with all sorts of problematic ingredients, foods that were causing obesity, foods that were just making it so much harder on the pet owner to really understand what was going on and what they needed to do. Why were vets making these recommendations? Well, a lot of it has to do with malpractice insurance. A lot of it has to do with, you know, their minimal education in nutrition. Um, I mean, unless they are specialized in nutrition, most vets have their education provided to them from pet food companies. And not so surprisingly, the pet food companies that they recommend. Um, many vets also rec um, sell these products and these foods in their actual offices. So, you know, there's an inherent bias there. So between a lack of education, a lack of information provided by those, you know, entities making claims about what should or should not be fed to the pets, it, there was this kind of compounding effect where it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And the aftermath of that is a, an entire slew of pet owners that are completely torn about what is best for their pets. And I'm going to tell you now, 
what I recommend and why. In my group, um, the Pad Foot Palms Facebook group, I keep a running list of foods that I recommend. I reevaluate them, um, you know, frequently over time. I'm constantly adding new foods to the list. And sometimes when companies change their ingredients, I'm removing things from the list. And I have some very strict guidelines that I follow that I will absolutely admit are extremely conservative. So that prompts me to talk to you about the latest research. Um, so I just shared the latest research in the Padfoot Palms group. So if you want to go and read the full case study, you know, please hop on over there, use the little um, magnifying glass search option in the group and search for DCM. And you can find all of the detailed information um, that I have in the group regarding DCM, you know, since this whole thing started. So in the most recent research, um, they did a case study of 150 dogs. And in this case study, they had a very wide scope. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it means that they were evaluating quite a few different components that were claimed to be, you know, the problem that was causing DCM, right? Um, some of the claims were that it had to do with the exotic proteins. Some of the claims had to do with legumes. Some of them had to do with nightshades. There were multiple claims that were made, and for a while it was really hard to keep track of, okay, well, what, what are we saying is going on here? So, in this latest case study, they did not find a link to the legumes in the food to DCM. And here is why I have a problem with that. Of course, they had to find a squeaky toy, so, Hold that thought. I confiscated the squeaky toy. Okay, let's get back to it. So they didn't find a link. The reason why this doesn't change what I recommend is because the scope of what they were searching for was too wide. So in when you're doing research, it's you have to think about it like a flashlight. If you have a flashlight and it has a very wide scope of vision, then really twigs. Okay, so hopefully the dogs will lay down and relax now. So when um, they did this latest research, right, 150 dogs, the scope of the research was very wide. They were investigating multiple different angles and it really wasn't very focused. And the reason why I have an issue with this is because you have to think about a case study like a flashlight. If you have a flashlight that has this wide beam, right? You're, you're getting so much input in that wide beam that it ends up diluting the light, right? So you may not see as many things because the light is not as bright as it would be if you had a very focused beam. And case studies are, are very much like this. So when you have a case study and you're looking at one specific outcome that you're either trying to prove or disprove, hopefully you're coming from a completely unbiased place. You've got you know, various steps that you have to take to make sure that the research is unbiased. You, know, you have to have a control and all of these factors that play into it. If you don't have all of those things, then what you end up with in the end is a very interesting research paper that someone can then, you know, jump off from to then do more specific research. So while the latest research case study that they did did not show a link, it's not going to change my recommendations. And here's why. So 
when I recommend pet foods, um, I said before, there are very uh, specific guidelines that I use um, that help me choose, you know, which options would be appropriate. And in those guidelines, since this whole DCM scare has happened, um, one of the main points and one of the very first things that I look at, and it's kind of like a deal breaker for me when I'm looking at a food, is if it includes legumes or nightshi nightshades in the food. So, um, the, the reason why this latest Kate study doesn't change what I recommend is it wasn't specific enough and there wasn't enough statistical data that came out of this to make me feel comfortable recommending those foods. Because for me, both from a loving the animal standpoint and wanting to help people, and also from an ethical standpoint, I would much rather sit back and wait for more concrete information. Because what I don't want to do is jump all over this case study and say, oh yeah, okay, well this proves that, you know, all those peas and chickpeas and beans that are in the food, they're fine, so you can just go ahead and start buying those foods again, right? Then fast forward two, three, maybe even five years later, more research is done and we find out, oh, hey, you remember that little case study we did? Yeah, that wasn't conclusive enough and now there's a bigger problem. Right? I mean, that would be absolutely heartbreaking, both for me as a professional and for anyone who then, based on my advice, went out and started feeding those foods. I would much rather be able to come to someone at the end of all of this, when we have all of the data, if it came out and it was decided, hey, you know, here's the data, there is no link, I would much rather be able to make a video and say, hey guys, guess what? I was wrong. And all those years that I gave you the conservative advice not to feed these foods, as it turns out, it would have been fine, right? I would much rather make that video then come to you and say, hey, you remember when I told you this would be okay? Was it turns out there wasn't enough information at the time and I was wrong, right? Because then all of this potential damage could have been done. And that's also one of the ethically based reasons why when people ask me, you know, would you, you know, of these two options, option A and option B, which do you recommend because that's all I can feed, I have to politely decline and say neither. I I'm sorry, I cannot choose the best of two evils you know, that's like saying, you know, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about getting a burger, which is better, McDonald's or Hardee's? Or which is healthier, McDonald's or Hardee's? Okay, well, you know, they're, they're both equally as bad, right? So anyway, that's where we are with the research. That's where we are with what I recommend if you haven't already, um, you should absolutely join our Facebook group. Get on there, take a look at the recommendation list, take a look at our list of problematic ingredients and see how your food measures up. Does it contain a whole bunch of those ingredients? Okay, well, you might wanna reevaluate what you're feeding. And it's not just the food. You've gotta look at the treats too. You have to keep in mind that our dogs don't get to choose what they're fed, right? They rely on us to be their advocates. And the absolute best that you can do for your dog is to learn how to read the, the labels, understand what those ingredients are and why they're problematic. And that is absolutely what I try to do, both on this channel, um, in our other food related videos and in our Facebook group. So 
If you like the video, please give me a big thumbs up. It helps me out a lot. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe. I'd love to have you as a subscriber. And um, if you have any questions or concerns, I read all of the comments. So please leave them down below and I'll be sure to get to them. And let me know if there's a specific nutrition related video that you would like to see and I'll make it for you. So I hope that you guys are having a great day and we'll see you in the next video.